Yo, it's the freaking Frack Show, a podcast for the fans. By this the is fans. the freaking Frack Show, a podcast for the for fans. The fans by, by the, the fans. fans. Frack Show, a podcast for the fans by the fans. All right, guys, you're watching the freaking Frack Show podcast for the fans. for the fans by the fans. Well, My man. Hello. What a what a what a great um episode to release as our first episode of the new year. <laughs> yeah, brother. Like we, we were just talking off camera and and it was one of those things where I'm, I'm like, man, we should be recording this as as we're talking because <laughs> our, our first guest of 2022 is astonishing. I yeah. mean the accomplishments, which which brings up a point, you know, every time I watch that intro. And we kind of watch the evolution of the show and how, yeah. you know, this episode 72, man, in, in a year and a half. And that, a lot of that's the the work and that you've put in behind the scenes to get us to this point. I know we don't talk about it on camera, nor <laughs> nor, nor do, you know, the the audience, do they know what yeah. you do to make these things happen? And, and I kind of wanted to save it till we hit record to to thank you. You know, you yeah, you yeah. you have lived. Yes. The, the guests have lifted the show to, mm -hmm. to something that we never thought it would be. But without you, Frack, Caleb, my one of my best friends, they, we wouldn't be on episode 72. You know, there's a lot of times Thank throughout you, this where I've, I've kind of thrown my hands up and I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. Some, something as simple as Internet, right? I'm 33 and here yep. we are trying to figure out my Internet solution. But you're <laughs> you are the backbone of this show, sir. Mm -hmm. So I. I applaud you for for keeping this thing going like you have. So thank you. Oh, it's no problem, man. You know, it's fun. Like uh, yesterday night, you know, yesterday night, it was like, uh, or today, 2.30 in the morning, I was messaging managers and publicists and, and actors and actresses and musicians. And, you know, and uh, it's uh, it's an everyday kind of thing. Uh, you know, whenever we, we made this, um, whenever we made this podcast, the podcast is centered on the 90s and boy bands. And we, we kind of got the majority of people that we ever wanted to speak, had the opportunity to speak to. And then, of course, we were like, you know what, let's make this 90s and a 2000s, uh, you know, podcast. And, you know, the, the it broadened our horizon with, you know, get, getting the opportunity to, to speak to, uh, I think, over 30, uh, you know, musicians, celebrities, I mean, you know everybody that we've had on and it's just been an incredible 72 episodes with you man and uh it's really exciting because we have so much planned for 2022 and um and i mean of course with even just this particular episode man it's just uh you know we said a bucket list a dream come true episode because this guy when when when, when we see him in series when we when we see him in movies it's just always you know it's going to be a good time you know, of every scene that he's in. Uh, I remember watching, uh, you know, even recently I was watching El Camino, uh, the Breaking Bad spinoff, because uh, it's been a while. And I was like, of course he's in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking the same thing, bro. <laughs> of course you know? Larry's in it. Yeah. But, but you know, like, you know, because I mean, he's in Breaking Bad and, and quite a few episodes as well uh, for about, uh, I think, two seasons or so. And uh, but like, you know, every time, uh, you know, he's in anything and anybody can agree. I mean, people will go back to Seinfeld and friends. Cause I mean, those, <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, he's, he's, this guy is a, uh, is, it's going to be a, a very pleasant experience and a very, very fun episode, uh, with him. And we're truly honored to have him on, man. Yeah, man. I, I and again, kudos to you and, 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 uh, debut entertainment, which, Yes. Shout out um, to you guys, man. This is uh, making things happen. Definitely. Miss Sarah, we would love and appreciate you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for so much for, uh, you know, making this happen. And, and of course, let's go ahead and thank, thank our guy here. Mr. Larry Hankin. What's up, brother? Ooh, what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, that you were in my living room. Uh, how you doing? How's it going? Doing great. Doing great, man. That's great. You are our 
our first guest of 2022, my man. This is episode 72. This is a podcast for the fans, by the fans. Ooh, Caleb New and Year. myself. Great. Freaking track. Happy New yeah. Year. Yeah. Let's uh let's actually talk about the first thing is what was your 2021 experience? Well, it was uh, being sequestered in writing. I mean, actually, uh, I I, I uh, used it as a, a plus and not a minus in a way. I mean, yeah, lost all my friends. <laughs> I'm shut in. Uh, my my entire body is atrophying from not being used. Uh, yeah. But I, I since I I was in my apartment m- most of the time, I, I started to write. I wrote two screenplays and I'm just finishing a, a book. So it, it, it's great. I mean, I, I, I use the time well, and I guess most people, you know, don't have that opportunity. You know, they probably have kids or, you know, have to go to work or whatever. But show business is a cruel mistress, but there are upsides to it. Uh, That's right. A long time in between jobs. <laughs> it seems like a downer, but you know you can use that time for you know your own whatever. I use it to to write and make my little films. I make little you know film shorts when I have a lot. Uh, I just have to make enough money when I do make a job, you mm-hmm. know, get an audition or whatever, to to then be able to spend it on what I want to spend it, not on rent or food or. <laughs> Dentist or whatever, <laughs> you know, laundry. Why? Well, you know. Oh, the cost uh, of laundry. Yeah, <laughs> the show business is just sitting around doing laundry and then memorizing lines. That's it. That's show business. Uh, but so I, I wrote, like I say, two screenplays and a, and a book. So that was that was great. Um, yeah. Trying to get it published now, which is very hard. Yeah. That's a whole yeah. job in itself. Every time you do something, they don't tell you the the other stuff. They just say, oh. well, why don't you write a book? Great idea. You know, yeah, you've had an interesting life. Write a book. Okay. <laughs> you know, six months, you know, just. Oh. And I, okay, I finished it. Now what? Oh, now you got to write a query letter. Mm. Well, what the hell is that? Well, you got to do <laughs> And then, well, it's wow. not like that. You got to put this in there and it's got to be that, you know? So so then you have to read the darn book that you just wrote to find out what the hell it's about. <laughs> oh. <laughs> letter. So that's like another month of just going back and forth. And, well, no, it's this. It, you see what I'm where I'm going with. <laughs> no, next, next, they're gonna they're gonna ask you to to read the audio book for Audible, man. And I'll tell you this much: they've already I'll tell you this much. <laughs> yeah, I, I, if if it becomes available on Audible, you have to do the narrator. Oh yeah, to, man! Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Looking forward to that. I already. Yes. Well, you know the the interesting thing about the book is I don't have a name for it, so I can't. It's going to be you know the the life of Larry Hankin. So, you know, Frickin' frack. You know, something like that. You there know, you go. Whatever it is. But uh, but basically, it's just about the stories that I tell all my life about what I did in show business. You know, well, I met this guy and we did this and I had an audition for that. So that that's it. It's just my life story. And then yeah. you read it and you see, wow, how stupid was I here? You know? <laughs> I do that too. Yeah. yeah, Holy, yeah. <laughs> it's embarrassing, man. You start reading yeah. it and you see, what, you know, why, what was I thinking when I told him <laughs> that? <laughs> oh man you know? yeah but it's all in there you know uh yeah. it's a, it's it's a good read for for me i gave it to two friends they liked it but but also you you see it's like going to a psychiatrist you know oh, you write your life yeah. out you know you're talking to him i understand what psychiatry is now <laughs> basically what you do is you tell over a period of time, you know, once a week or however you do it, you tell your your life story. Well, I did this and I felt this way. Blah 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 blah. blah. <laughs> over over a year or so. Well, the psychiatrist knows then more about you than you do. You're you're talking. You're not listening. That's He's true. Listening and putting it into a book is like the ear of the psychiatrist. 
And then I read it back, and now I know what the psychiatrist knows. <laughs> and this guy's got dyslexia. He's got ADHD. Oh, yeah. A, you know, he, you know, he's a... Uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, but you invade other people's spaces by telling them the truth. <laughs> yeah. Which yep. is a big mistake. You know, why did I tell them that? Why? Uh, so you see what your life, I've seen what my life was. It's edifying. Yeah. And it's, yeah. you know, you learn a lot about yourself. So that that's kind of cool. And then you start wondering why. Well, Will anybody else care? You know, it's interesting. Mm. Uh, it, it's interesting to me and what I found what found out about me, not what I wrote. You know, oh. the, that that's what I knew. Uh, you know, oh, you know, I had this fight on the set with this guy, and uh, he said that, and I said this. Yeah, well, that's it. Then when you read it, you mm -hmm. know, like five years later, where, you know, after it happened, you go, why did I say that? I oh, mean, what, man. you know. You know what? But a friend of mine who read that particular book said, yeah, that was really interesting, man. You got any more things where you fight? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what people say. Well, why? Well, that's what people want to read, man. You know, yeah. they want to read, you know, the real stuff. You know, the they're down to the bone, man. Yep. <laughs> okay. Cool. You know, it's just kind of embarrassing, but okay. So that's <laughs> That's what I've been doing in co while in COVID, just yeah. doing this stuff. Either the screenplays or, you know, pieces of your life that you turn into a story. So it kind of is camouflaged. And, and, that, and that's cool. So you can, <laughs> you can proofread your own screenplay and not get embarrassed because it's all hidden about the relationship <laughs> with women and stuff. No like one that. knows but you. Yeah, nobody knows. <laughs> but if you say, no, there's a... Is an autobiography. Yeah. You know, you're kind of naked in a way, but you are. Like I can say my friends thought it was pretty cool. So, okay, let's just keep on going. Keep that's on a good going. start. It's yeah. a very, very good start. So that, that's what, that's what I've been doing for the last two years is, is, is that, you know, uh, and thinking of what, you know, now that it's, well, I wonder if this is ever going to be over. No, I, I don't think so. I, I think we're going to have to. No. I'm going to have to figure out how to live with how, the the this today. Yeah. What it is today, tomorrow, I don't know. You know, brain waves. You know, one is wow. I'm still in the old days, and I'm trying to catch up to. I'm just learning digital now. Oh man! Today. Zoom. The bad, here's the bad. The upside of <laughs> COVID. Zoom. Definitely. Uh, but but now when I talk about things that were dangerous in my time, mm. as I was growing up in college, even now it's part it's just part of the conversation. It it's and I, I have to wow. get used to that. That yeah. it's not only the new normal for people like you and for this age, but it's a new, new normal for me. I can't get used to getting used to it. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's weird. And I kind of enjoy the, I don't know, the, the back and forth that my oh, brain yeah. is going through. You know, the <laughs> that my brain has to keep on. you. I just learned one new thing in digital and then somebody said, or like the book thing. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm writing a book and, well, you finished the book. Now you got to do this. Oh, Oh, here's another thing. You have to have it proofread. Oh, like, yeah. Proofreading. Ooh. Nobody will read your two things. I, I just learned one thing and I just learned the new thing. Yesterday <laughs> was a big day. I learned a lot of things yesterday. <laughs> uh, one is you, you write a book. Okay, now what? Well, you got to get it proofread. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that means you have to send it to somebody. So it's like, weeks or days to, you, yeah. you don't do anything because it's in somebody else and then they come back and then they say all these things have to be retyped you know, typos so now you have to go through 200 300 pages it's your book <laughs> just <laughs> typing retyping typos oh. and then, then, no you can't type numbers you've got to type out the words <laughs> oh, yeah Oh, now I got to do that over. Okay. And then, mm. okay, now that you've proofread it, now you've got to write a query letter. Mm -hmm. and then you have to reread the book to find out what you wrote. 
And it just keeps it. And so here's another thing I just learned yesterday. Now that I learned all that is, <laughs> no, you've got to double space it. Nobody will read it if you don't double space it. <laughs> I didn't know that. Why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> I'm going to double space it all so the 300 pages are going to be like 400 or 400 That's right. pages. And I got to send that to somebody. Oh, you know, this uh, is fantastic. Well, and then and then that's the, the, the new stuff I just learned up until today. Tomorrow, somebody's going to say, hey, you know mm -hmm. what you also have to do? <laughs> is get this an is agent a... oh no <laughs> the work is not done the work is not done and then the agent has to send it to a publisher and, and, you know, okay mm -hmm. I'm through you know what the best thing about that is eventually you will be through with the book eventually will be... <laughs> that's, yeah. that's right it'll be done and, and then you have to advertise it Oh yeah, then you gotta go to a book tour. You gotta go to Books a Million and Barnes and Noble and, and then start maybe signing. Maybe a book tour and then and freaking frack show again. Plane, but that's COVID yeah. and then. Oh God, <laughs> my, gosh, my face hurts from smiling. <laughs> um, so the hardest part of being out of work is being out of work. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's really a job and a half, man. I'd rather work. Oh than, yeah, than be COVIDized. So I understand, you know, a little of. What people are going through, you know. Yeah. I mean, if, if they're not in show business, if they just have normal <laughs> that word normal. It's just <laughs> a stupid word now. It is. You can't is. use the word normal. You can't. <laughs> you cannot use that way. I had a normal job. Yep. That and, sounds right. And it's not normal. We're working from home now. <laughs> uh, what do we do with the kids? You know, mm. it's the worst. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, when they sent us home to work from home the first time, I was like, this is going to be incredible. This is yeah. going to be amazing. Nobody told me I was going to have to be a dad and work from home at the same time. That just doesn't work well. And it's, yeah, I'd say what I don't like it. Yeah, we, 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 we have to ask you. We want you to start from the from the beginning. Uh, not the day you were born because you probably don't remember that too well. I remember it exactly. <laughs> I bet you do. I bet Fucking you do. You You're incredible. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Best episode ever. Yes. It wasn't fun, but you know, I me and mom worked it out. <laughs> you, climbed, yeah. you climbed your way out, you swam, and then somebody slapped me. You just <laughs> oh, Started cutting me. <laughs> cut, what cutting the my hell, vocals. you know. Yep. And then the next 16 years, Jesus. <laughs> it was a grind. I understand. It was a grind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. How did you get your start? How did you get your start, man? Where are you from? Okay. Far Rockaway, Long Island. And I went to uh, Far Rockaway High School, a PS 106 Horace Mann Public School. Uh -huh. uh, and hey, here's the thing. I was born with dyslexia, and I didn't find out about it until a couple of years ago. So wow. the reason that wow. I, I mentioned that, yeah, uh, it's very I, – and it caused me to have a very interesting life because one of the things about dyslexia is uh, misinterpretation. Mm. Of uh, social signals and uh, reading, it it doesn't it doesn't interfere with your intelligence. It, it interferes yeah. with how you process information uh, and, and and where you put it and <laughs> how you combine it. So uh, I had an interest in life because I would always say the wrong thing at the wrong time, or the right thing at the wrong time, or the wrong thing at the right time. Uh, and, and then I always figured once I found out, I said, well, I got a 50-50 shot. That means no, I could be wrong, but I could yeah. be right. It's just a misinterpretation. You know, it's just and sometimes there's a third way, which <laughs> totally blows my mind. You know, uh, so uh, uh, then I went to Syracuse and that's where the the big thing happened, where I. I discovered show business. Um, I've always been in, um, you know, plays, high school plays. 
But here, oh, I just remembered it just now because I'm talking to you guys. Okay. In, in, um, in public school was the first um, combination of being in show business and dyslexia. And I remember it vividly now, all of a sudden, out of nowhere. Uh, I, we were doing a school play, public school, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was an, below the fifth grade. It was very, very young. Uh, we were all very young, so it wasn't. Okay. And I had a nice part, but I was in the first, uh, the, there was, say, let's say there's five acts. I was in the second act and the fourth act. Okay, I come out, I do my second act speech or whatever I had to do. And in the middle of my second act speech, I just went into my fourth act speech. So all the kids, yeah, all the kids got it. They said, oh, Larry went into the fourth act. Now, kids are kids. (laughs) We're all the same age. So, okay, let's just go into the fourth act. (laughs) Oh, so everybody went into the fourth act and, and it was very smooth. No, you know, no, you know, oh my God, oh my, none of that. Yeah. Well, the teachers I saw went, oh, like that. <laughs> but we children didn't notice that or it didn't seem weird to us. I just noticed, oh, they're freaking out. I guess I don't know why. And we kept on doing it. And then the, sh- the play ended very shortly, <laughs> you know, and and, and then the audience applauded, you know, okay, it's a, it's a, it's a short play, like a film short. Okay, <laughs> Go. And, they, and they clap. And then one of the stars in the third act um, came at me, one of the mothers of the stars, who, who I, in other words, everybody in the third act was written out. Yeah. It never appeared. Well, <laughs> one of the mothers was really incensed and she came at me this time, you know, I'm like, what, seven, six or seven? I don't know. Wow. And yelling at me, how dare you leave my son? And that was the big, how dare you leave my son out? He rehearsed all week. Well, you know, I didn't blame her, and I could understand her discombobulation over it. Yeah. But there's nothing I can do. The play's over, you know. <laughs> but but so that was a sign that I had dyslexia. But Yeah. yeah. Okay, cut to Syracuse University, my introduction to show business. This is the end of the story. Is uh, I, I graduated as an industrial designer. I went to college just to please my parents. I didn't want to go to college. They wanted me to have a profession so I could take care of them in their old age. Never helped. Uh, so uh, I went into industrial design because I saw the word design, and I thought it was art. Design, art, see, I, I'm a painter, really. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I design. And then it was industrial design. That's all calculus and mass, and math and mechanics and redesign. Oh, so I didn't want to, I really didn't want to do that. But I went through, I got an A minus. You know, I, I'm a good student. I, I, I just yeah. want to be good. You know, I'm a good guy. I want to do it well. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was thrown out a couple of times. <laughs> and I got back in without telling my parents. My parents never knew, so that was cool. And then on graduation n- night, my best friend was Carl Gottlieb. He wrote Jaws. Eventually, That's, he wrote Jaws. He didn't write wow. Jaws. Wow. But we 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 hung out together. We were best friends. We we were the only two who really understood each other's jokes. You know, we were kind of <laughs> weird that way. And um, <laughs> so he said to me, uh, "Where are you going? When you, we were going to graduate, it was graduation." Next week, we're going to graduate. Where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going to go to Detroit and design cars, but I really don't want to do that. I mean, they're paying me a lot of money. Uh, in those days, a lot of money. But I don't want to do that, and I've never done what I don't want to do. I mean, even as a kid, I would just back off or something. So where are you going? And he said, I'm going to Greenwich Village, and I'm going to become a writer. And so I said, well, that sounds cool. Why can't we be roommates? Let's let's go to Greenwich Village. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I'll probably starve, but it's better than going to Detroit for $75,000 a year. Wow. Uh, so I, that's what I did. And to me, $75,000 a year meant nothing. I, I didn't go, yeah. wow, or it was I didn't want to do that. So you, if there's something you don't want to do, you, there's not enough money to pay you to do it. It was just... 
It was, in other words, basically what I thought it was, I had to go to five, five years in college. That was mm. the course, was five years. To me, it was just, oh, another five years of this. Mm. I hated college. I just was doing it, you know, for my parents. Carl came up to me and said, uh, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to Greenwich Village. When we moved to Greenwich Village, he got a job and I just did open mic nights for no reason whatsoever except wow. for that open mic nights I can do because I won funniest in high school. And that's wow. how I got into show business. And I did open mic nights and then I was opening for Woody Allen. Uh, wow. That was funny. I really was funny. I was a funny guy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> humor back. And uh, I opened for Woody Allen. And then I started to tour with the Love and Spoonful and open for rock bands. And I was doing arena shows. And, and, wow. then, and, then, and then I got into critical thinking. You know, Lenny Bruce, Richie Pryor, George Carlin. Uh, wow. Bill Burr, the goats. You know, all those guys. Uh, and the cops started pulling me off this. This is the 60s and the 70s. Wow. So they started doing to me what they did to Lenny, man. But I wasn't into drugs, and Lenny was. So mm -hmm. he couldn't take those punches and those those cops. He couldn't. And they destroyed him. So uh, and then one line in the book says, I wasn't into drugs then. Well, I was <laughs> healing, and then the cops are taking me. Well, I had healed. The cops were taking me off the stage, and people were coming at me with beer bottles. <laughs> So, wow. you know, I, I I said to myself, well, I also said to a couple of friends, you know, I'm not into drugs yet, hmm. but the way the crowds are going, they're going to drive me to it a lot faster. Man. And I think that's what was going on with Lenny. I mean, I mean, just to get back on the stage. Anyway, so I, I did the tour. I did the Love and Spoonful. And then I got into the, I couldn't take that when they were coming at me with the, uh, beer bottles so my manager who is Woody's manager said join Second City they're doing what Lenny's doing and yeah uh, but they own the theater so they'll throw the guy with the beer bottle out you know so that's what I did I auditioned I got into Second City and then we split five of us and opened the committee in San Francisco and that's wow. how we came down to Hollywood because they would come up it was $35 round trip <laughs> wow. For air in 1969, 70, 75, 35 dollars round trip from Hollywood to San Francisco. So it'd fly up, see the show, and a hit show. We were we were held over. We were open for ten years. So wow. uh, that's and then. But they would call us, go down for a week, come go down for a day. But then. They would go down for a day and not come back because the money would be <laughs> good and they would get an agent. So after a while, the five wow. disappeared. And then I was left, me me and the director were the only ones left from the original company. And he had um, just a company from San Francisco in Northern California. So they had no professional schooling. I mean, to be an improviser in Second City, you have to go to Second City school. I mean, you can't just get up there. And, wow, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, and then and then, so we were all trained in Second City. When, when at, so when we split, we all knew we had gone to school for improvisation. We mm -hmm. just opened up a new theater. But after ten years, you know, you go through two or three or four companies, mm. and, and and it just starts to get less and less fun. You know, because they're learning on the stage and you don't know the people. And this, so I, I finally went down too. They all said, yeah, you can you can couch surf down here. Come on. Everybody who you knew from San Francisco is down here now. So that's what I did. <laughs> and and, and the, the rest is history. The rest <laughs> is on the internet. <laughs> Co comedy and improv, it has such a, uh, I don't know how to put it. Such a such a historic background to it, right? I, I watched this documentary on Showtime uh, last year about the comedy store in L.A. and Pauly Shore's mom, uh, Missy Shore, and how she would give everybody, like Richard Pryor would come through and, yep. and gave a bunch of people their starts. And, you know, she kind of was judge, jury, and, and all of the above <laughs> for the, those people. Well, if she liked you. 
stand up is is different than improv because stand up mm -hmm. even if you get out like for open mic nights even if you get just three minutes mm -hmm. you have first of all it's single she's dealing with one person yeah. one person can, can get on stage and die and kill and do anything uh get be booed off the stage but that's when true. you get two people on the stage that's huh. a whole different thing if they don't have the same thought in mind which you can't have in improvisation that's one of the rules you wow can't, you can't plot you can't say i know where this scene is going man you can't because then he doesn't you can't read your mind i can't read your mind Mm -hmm. So the, the instinctive thing to do is this is the scene is dying. I know I know how to save it. That's the worst thing that you could do. The, mm -hmm. Then it's just a, you know the lights going to a slow fade as the huh, silence yeah. in the audience. That's the worst. So it's an, antithetical. It's anti anti. You know whatever the rules are, it's anti. Yeah. So. That's a, a, a bad hookup, hmm. sure, and a, 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 and an improv director. <laughs> what you learn as a stand-up, because I was a stand-up. I was opening for Woody Allen, you know, and, and yeah. a lot of other comedians and, and big stars. The, the, the things that I learned as a stand-up comedian, I had to just get rid of, and it took a while, mm. you know. I was a, I was a hard learner. I, I don't like to learn. Yeah. I'm curious. No, no. I'm curious. I like to learn. I don't like to be taught. That that's the difference. That makes sense. Definitely. Yeah. And they were trying to teach me how to improvise, and I just. <laughs> just no, no. Uh, it's kind of hard to change. You get it. One day you get it. You know. You yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. If I don't, if I don't plot, just go with what they're doing. Yep. It's a very difficult yep. thing. It's just go with, go with that. One of my uh, one of my absolute most favorite movies is a uh, movie from the uh, I guess from the seventies uh, called Billy Jack. Yeah, the know. gritty was in that, and I was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh man, man. I just like wouldn't let it go. I'm a huge, <laughs> I'm a huge Billy Jack fan. And it's got one of the best oh, wow. improv scenes ever. You know, when, say that again. It's got one of the best improv scenes I've ever really? seen. Uh, yeah, it's uh, they're all in the park, and uh, you don't know it's with the sheriff, uh, Sheriff Cole, and uh, like three guys from the school, and they're all improving the whole situation about the gun. And the guy's like, "Well, can I be the robber?" Uh, it's it's brilliant. It's, that's that's a scene from the committee. And and that's even a scene even further back from uh, Willard and Willard and Fred oh. Willard. Oh man! The thing man. that got me into into the when I went to Greenwich Village, mm -hmm. and I was just going to open mic nights, or I was just sitting and watching. I mean, maybe I would, I worked for two weeks in a bar from two a.m. to six a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. cleaning the duckboards behind the bar, cleaning up. About two mm -hmm. weeks. So before I went to work at 2 a.m., I would go to the coffee houses and just sit and watch the comedians. That's how I got the idea of, hey, I'm a funny guy. I can do that. Uh, I was going to all the coffee houses to watch the open mic nights. And in one, the Cafe Bazaar, I remember, I went in and there was an actual comic team. It wasn't an open mic night. It was, you know, 20 minutes. And it was Fred Willard and, oh my and his partner. And they were doing a, a, a gun scene. That that's I, right. I remember the committee took part of it. We didn't steal it, but we used mm -hmm. the premise of the gun and who's got the gun and dropping the gun. That's and right. We, but Fred was really funny, man. Uh, wow, that's incredible. Be on the stage. You know, there's I wait. I can. I would I would watch the open mic nights and say I can do that. I can do that. But when I saw mm -hmm. Fred Willard. I mean, I wanted to get up and do that. Inspiring. Yeah, he just inspired me to say, "Yeah, right, next open mic night, I'm signing." You had to sign up, you know, in the beginning. Yeah, going in. So, so I signed up, and I was bad, you know. <laughs> and then I just got better and better because 
for some strange reason, I guess all comedians have some sort of photographic memory for laughter. Wow. A, if, if I said something that was funny, I would remember the setup and the punchline for the laugh. And, and anything else that I said that wasn't funny, I would just forget. I mean, even if I try to remember it. Well, what was I talking about that got me into that line? And, mm -hmm. the and all I did was, well, so I, and then you just collect them after about three or four open mic nights. You've got 10 minutes of pure, pure, you know, one liners laugh, one liners laugh, one liners laugh. You wow. just, your, your mind just automatically co collects them. It does. Well, you know, so that's, but Fred was one of the guys who, who did That's it. incredible, man. That's well, truly really, incredible. He to the, well, he, he's gone now. But yeah. I went over to his house you know, when he had parties and stuff like that. Uh, his, wow. his wife was a big party thrower. <laughs> and we used to, you know, reminisce about Greenwich Village. But everybody wow. back in the day, I mean, Bob Dylan was there. Uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary was there. Um, they were all there when I was there. Yeah. And they weren't there. They weren't them then. Yeah. Bob Dylan wasn't Bob Dylan then. He was just this guy who I couldn't take. <laughs> I, I hear that about voice Bob Dylan. Was from a lot of playing was awful. <laughs> Little did I know he was a genius. Uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I came around finally. <laughs> Years later. <laughs> it, it, it took me a while. But yeah, I mean, and one one day he came into the committee because he was playing Berkeley, and and uh, I walked out on Bob Dylan in the in Greenwich Village when he was just Ooh. playing Bernie's Folk City. Yeah, I mean he was packed. I mean you gotta go down and hear this guy, man. I said yeah. Bob Dylan. I thought he would be an older guy, you know. He was this little guy, you, you know. He's only about two or three years younger than me now, but he, mm -hmm. he was short and he had a twelve string in a case. So the case was as big as he was. So I think, you know, everyone's talking about this guy. He's like too wow. tiny to be a great folk singer. I don't understand. <laughs> and the place was packed. I mean, you couldn't even get in. I had to just stand by the door to look. And then he came in with wow. a guy. Here's the mystery. He came in. He passed right by me to get through the crowd to get to the stage. He had this huge guitar case. And he was surrounded by, I would say, seven or eight. 15 year olds, girls. They were fans, mm -hmm. like a gaggle, and they just followed him in. He got up on stage. Years later, you know, and they were they were his fans. No, everybody else was everybody else who was in the village, they had all heard about this guy. Not me. Yeah. So he gets up on the stage and he starts singing, and I walked out. I just by years, you know, I'm from far away, <laughs> middle class Jewish family. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I walk out on him. I was right mm -hmm. by the door, so it was very easy. You know, just, boom, okay, goodbye. Okay, wow. years later, when I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan now, you know. I, I Definitely. Collecting all his records, blah, blah, blah. I'm in the committee, and away, you know, and I'm in the kitchen. That was the green room, the kitchen, <laughs> to the stage. And you, <laughs> I'm in the kitchen, you know, waiting to go on. Uh, no, the, the show was over, and I'm just sitting there waiting for the crowd to disperse. It was late Saturday, the last show, Saturday night. And a waitress comes in and says, uh, Bob Dylan's in the lobby. Uh, he wants to talk to you. And I Whoa. go, Bob Dylan is in the audience. This is years later. I remember when you walked out on me. <laughs> and and I'm thinking, what could Bob, how does he even know I'm here? This is San Francisco. I know he's in Berkeley, but I couldn't figure it out. And then I said, oh, I walked out on him. He wants to know why. I mean, <laughs> The, the hubris of thinking that Bob Dylan is going to look for the guy, right. one guy in that crowd who walked out on him <laughs> five years ago, 10 years ago, he's going, to, he's going to look for, he's in the committee. I want to talk to that guy. Afraid to go out and talk to him because now he's my hero and he's going to holler at me for walking out. I mean, I see him. So finally I did. I walked out and what he wanted me to do, which I didn't understand. I was so naive. What he wanted me to do was write a um, uh, an MTV video, you know, those short videos to a song, you know. Yeah. Cuts. Mm -hmm. So what he wanted me to do is there with Bobby Newirth, his road manager, who's was a cool guy in, in itself. You know? And I, I couldn't, 
you know, no, what he was talking about was just fast cuts. MT but I hadn't watched MTV, MTV in those days. It was just new. And yeah. he obviously was on the cutting edge. People were coming to him with ideas. Mm -hmm. So New Earth just gives him an elbow. We were, we were sitting in a bar by, by then. And I, those two guys are sitting across from me. So yeah. I, I just sat there. And Dylan just said, yeah, yeah, I know. But let me just explain it to him. So he tried to explain it in another way, but I didn't get it. And then uh, he said, well, okay, I'll talk to you later. You know, thanks a lot. And goodbye. I mean, he was very friendly. Just a guy who wanted a favor. And he saw I wasn't into it. So he left. That's my whole life. I mean, yeah, just go on and on. Things that, 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 that. My, my regular <laughs> life, I guess regular would be better than normal. Mm -hmm. Regular. Yeah. Back there the, it is again. In yeah. the 70s. Yeah. I also got to put a timeline on it. <laughs> when you say uh, like regular life in the seventies, yeah. the regular seventies, in the eighties, <laughs> in the ninth, uh, was um, not as interesting. We, my, my regular life was mainly once I got to Hollywood. It, it was just you, you're doing it for the rent and yeah. the payments. It, yeah. It's it's a very sad existence to be a beginning actor in Hollywood. It's you're auditioning, r memorizing lines. And hoping for the next audition, trying to get an agent. It's all about show business. You, you, you can't yeah. think about anything else. And paying rent, mainly. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to do. Uh, pay the rent, car payments, laundry, <laughs> audition, agent. Okay, a, a week of just going in, going to bed early, getting up at a, you know, 7.30, mm -hmm. driving to the valley. That that's that's show business. I, I don't know what people I mean, I was in a hit show in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. They would come up and they would say, Hey, you know, get the tall guy or get the short guy or fly down, go back. Okay, now stay down here. You can get an agent. But but there was no trying. There was no you know, knocking on doors, making telephone calls, calling up there's none of that. You you were called, you go down. I had a job. I went back to it. And then if the money was good enough, I just stayed down there and got an agent. And then once you get an agent, you think, well, you got it made. Yeah. No, that's when that's when you've got to get the, the jobs. They yep. just negotiate the contract. I, to, to learn that took me two years. Yeah. Of, of figuring that out. Um, so my show business life, once I, you know, like after two, three, four years, you know, and then you get a, a rhythm and then you, and then you're known and they make phone calls. It gets a little easier. Mm. But then the, the parts start to get bigger and then my dyslexia would come in and I couldn't memorize it fast enough. There was, I can memorize, wow. but, but dyslexia, I, I would have to, and that was a normal thing I didn't know about it. that was a, a regular thing that i had in my contracts that larry gets the screenplay or the part as early as possible along with the first people who get the script and that was normal and then i would do that i would get that so i had a lag time uh, a lead time yeah than the other actors just for my dyslexia they didn't, they didn't have to know that they just said larry gets the script uh, soon first yeah that's all but when the part started to get really big we're like in uh, breaking bad when when they had the magnet when i oh yeah oh, I, <laughs> vince gilligan liked my acting like old joe and uh, so one day he assigned a writer to write me a big part because he liked old joe so wow. they wrote, so, but it didn't tell me. He just mm. had it for me when I got there to do my small part. And since there was no lag time, there was no lead time, and they didn't tell me, I had a, almost had a nervous breakdown. Because what they had was a monologue that was a full page. Well, yeah. that would take me a week Oof. to memorize. I, I would have to get a week ahead, that's all. And then I memorized it, and fine. But it was the day of the shooting of that scene. He gave me a 
full page speech. And when I saw it on my desk or, you know, on the, on the, uh, on the desk in, in my dressing room, I freaked out. Mm, I, I, I can't yeah. do this. I can't do this. I've got the AD. I said, no, I can't do this. And uh, he goes, well, he saw that I was having a nervous breakdown. So he split. He said, I, I got to go back to the set. I can't help you. Well, well, got to go. I have to do this. When is the shooting? When is the shooting? <laughs> In two hours. So I, I would improvise it. Now, what it was, I don't know if you remember it. There's no reason you should. But what I had to yeah. say was legalese to keep the cop out of the Winnebago. That that was the one scene. And it yep. was all legal. The, the legal reasons why the cop that was on my property, so the cop couldn't go in without uh, a writ of, I don't know, habeas corpus. Who knows? Yep. So right. Can't go in. All right. So I thought I would improvise it. You know, the, again, the hubris and the, mm. and the I'm not going to cop to it and the dyslexia. I mean, that was all wow. this was my daily thing. This is why I was dyslexia. I couldn't. Okay, so I didn't tell anybody. And then the, the knock on the door is, okay, you're up. You're seen. So I go out and I'm not, I said, oh, I'll just, Im I'll improvise. I'm an improviser, you know, fine. So the, the, the director and I had done a, a really cool scene in the morning with this director. So he was looking forward to, now he's going to do a full monologue. This is going to be fun. Because the morning was fun. I had yeah. five lines. It was easy. It was with Brian Cranston. I, I did it really well. You know, even Brian. Oh, yeah. Nice, you know. So here's the afternoon. Now we're going to have some more fun. And he said, you ready? And I go, uh, well... I have a way, I figured out a way. It's my way of covering for myself. Mm -hmm. I said to the director, um, I have a way, I figured out a way that would be really a cool way to direct this. And as, as soon as I said, I knew how to direct this, the director just went, oh, really? You know, he crossed his arms like this. Oh, really? You know how to direct this, Larry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't see <laughs> what you <laughs> obviously surmise. <laughs> uh, I said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, okay, let's let's hear this. How, how would you direct the scene, Larry? So when they say your name, it's not good. Mm, Remember, yeah. <laughs> it's, that's right. Uh, so. I said, well, what we can do is we can shoot it in sections, see? You know, you shoot it in there, and then you cut to me. So then I figured that I could memorize the sections. See, well, wow. I, would be I would be memorizing. He said, and I go through the whole thing, and he goes, really? Um, yeah, that's good. That's good. But uh, we're going to do it in one take. We're going to do a walk and talk. You're going to get down oh. about 100 feet and you're just going to walk to the camera and you can do the whole thing. And you see this car here and there's a limousine because we were out in the desert. Yeah. And there's a limousine parked near the camera, you know. And he said, and we're going to do the whole thing in one take and you're going to get in the limousine. We're sending you back to the production office. You're all finished for the day. Okay. Oh. So let's just do that. All right. <laughs> that, Larry? And I go, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, okay, I'll improvise it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, get down there. 100 feet. I get down there 100 feet. Okay, ready? Yeah. Okay, and action, Larry. And I start improvising. And all I, in my mind was, wow. don't hesitate and don't say um or uh. Just keep your mouth moving. Don't stutter. That's all. Wow. I, that's all. And I just walked and I talked. Now, I had read over the script so i had a couple of you know gems and things but it was all anything that i could pull to keep the wow man. thing and i just walked and i talked and i remembered the last line i remember the first line and the last line so when i got to the camera i said the last line and he goes and i and i also fired myself hmm. while i was walking and talking so i would be calm when he said you're fired so I, I just wow. myself. So I said my last line, and I said, and now I'm going to get fired. And he goes, <laughs> okay, Larry, let's do one more just for coverage, and you can hop in a limo and you're going home. Thank you. Okay, get back down there. <laughs> the whole thing. He didn't plank, man, nothing. He says, get back there, let's do it once more. Wow. Did it once more. 
And, you know, and I said, well, now I don't have to worry. I can stutter. I can do anything I want now. He said, he's got it in the can. This is coverage. This is insurance. Yep. I'm free. So I did it again. Didn't stutter. Didn't bumble. You know, just blah, 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 blah. but making it up, improvising it. And he goes, okay, thank you very much. Larry's dismissed. Thank you, Larry. Hop in a limo. Okay, boom, moving on. And he just went out. So I waited two weeks. They were showing it in two weeks. I waited two or three weeks. And then I watched it. And I told my two friends to watch it because I wanted to test them to see. Here's the here's it. Okay, I said the first line, which was the right line. It's on me. Okay. And blah, 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 blah. Cut to inside. Blah, 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 blah. Cut to the cop. Blah, 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 blah. Cut to I remember the, this. Blah, 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 blah. Cut to me saying the next line that seemed right or apropos. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. I'm in the scene 12 seconds, if that. They cut to me three times for three lines that were apropos to what was And what the director did, because at one point I said on the second try, uh, you know, when he said, go back and do it once more, you ready, go. In between then, I hesitated and the script girl showed me what I said wrong. Wow. And it was everything that was wrong. I had never seen <laughs> been in, wow. I've been in business all my life. I had never seen a script circled by the script girl, the script woman. Every wow. word, every word. And, and I said to her, what's, what's the matter? And she said, uh, you have to say it this way. And I said, no, no. He said, it's okay. He said, and she said, the director wants you to do it now verbatim. No. Oh. And I said, well, I got the gist of it. <laughs> and she said, verbatim. That way, you know, verbatim. Yeah. And I hear him go, is anything wrong, Larry? And I said, no. And he said, okay, let's do it. And, and we, oh, and then I said, well, well, he said it's okay. And that's mm. what I said to her. He wants you to do it. No, he said I should just do it. He said, the director wrote it. I go, oh. So in other words, the director oh. was making it up the first time. Yeah. Oh. Man. <laughs> So what he did was, which was genius, and that was the, oh, wow. What he did was he took my two takes mm -hmm. and edited it together and put it as a voiceover. That's and then he said something apropos, he cut to me, and he did what I said in the beginning. Do I was it. just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Exactly your idea. Right. But he never said anything, and that was his genius. I mean, yeah. in other words... He said, okay, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He can't memorize it. Let's just go with what he says. Let's not make a big stink. We got to, we're on a budget here. Mm -hmm. right. We'll take it. We'll edit. It. I mean, he was thinking way ahead. He, he knows yeah. how to do movies. Yep. So, you know, that's show business. That's my show business. It's not your show business. That's, right. So that's what I wrote about. That's what the book is about. All that stuff. Yeah. And like I say, you know, there's a, uh, that turned out great because mm -hmm. I watched the scene. I quizzed my friends and they said, you were walking and talking and you, you were keeping the cop out of the Winnebago. Well, what's the big deal? I said, wow. no, you see, you were walking and talking. No, I wasn't walking and talking. <laughs> what did you see? Movies is magic. It sure it is. It's really, you know, and, and also, you know, how to use that. The, the, the director was really brilliant. Really mm -hmm. brilliant. Yeah. Man. No business like it. You've worked on some incredible sets, man. You've, you've, you've worked with some incredible people. And I just found out that you knew Bob Dylan and you walked out on one of his sets. So that's amazing to me. <laughs> I think. Well, uh, I, I, I did come around finally. Yeah. Later, later, later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when do you anticipate the book to be released? Well, uh, I just finished it uh, five days, three days ago. I better put a period, and I handed it to a proofreader, and she called me back and she said, "Jesus Christ, is our a lot of typos." <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
words out of her mouth on the phone. Hey, Larry. <laughs> oh man. Oh man, you know, I said, well, but you are you're you're a proofreader. Yeah, but I'm a proofreader for screenplays, not books. <laughs> are 90 pages. This is you know 250. <laughs> uh, not double spaced. It's terrible. It's a thousand man. tribulations of being a yeah. performer in show business, trying to make a living. It's just, I don't know. Maybe I should have taken that job in Detroit. I don't know. <laughs> nah, you, you <laughs> took the right you took the right steps for no, sure. I, I man. What's what's next for you, Larry? What uh what can we what can we anticipate for 2022? Well, uh, the book. I'm uh, what I'm depending on really is the book. I mean, I really there, there's nothing I've done ever except uh, El Camino and Breaking Bad and um, uh, imitating Kramer on the oh. Seinfeld. Yeah. yeah. Those are the only two things I've ever done in my life that I, I try to do my best and I, I did my best. In other words, I wasn't, wow. I had no excuses. There wasn't anything bothering me. I did what I came to do and I did a good job. I think I did a good job. And those are the two. Other than that, I just, I made a, a nice living. I had time to paint. Uh, that's yeah. what I'm going to do. Uh, so I'm depending on the book to be successful so that I can make enough money to do my film short, maybe write another book. Cause I have, I only did 45 of the movies that have been in telling you the stories. There's a whole other. Yeah. Well, I've done 182 movies and TV shows. So, uh, so I got a lot of munitions. Yeah. I make my film shorts and do my paintings. That That's what's next. Reallarryhankin.com is my website. And all my paintings are on there. There's about 40 of them. And all my and a, a lot of my film shorts are on there. So you can see that. The reallarryhankin.com. But I have a book out already called The Loopholes Dossier. That's not about me at uh. all. That's stories. That's funny fables and two satiric, I guess, stories. It's a good read. I don't like the cover. The cover is a bad design. But, <laughs> but other than that, it's a cool read. Yeah. Okay, that's the ads. No, those are the ads. <laughs> Thank you. You Perfect. put it on the screen. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. We'll uh, we'll drop it in the comments uh, in the description so people can check those out, man, and, and go get those books. I. I, you have an incredible story and just like your first, just like your book that you're writing now, I think there needs to be a part two of, of the freaking frack Larry Hankins episode. Sure, so man. I mean, first of all, uh, when the book comes out, you know, that, that would be cool. But yeah. anyhow, anytime you have like, uh, you know, somebody didn't show up or something. <laughs> <laughs> Only once. Yeah. Only oh. once. <laughs> I'll be sequestered. Hey, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll interrupt. To talk to you guys, uh, we, we, we would love to have you back on, man. Uh, it's, well, it's up to you, so that's fine. That's cool. No, it's it's yeah. a definite must. Uh, we we like people who can tell us stories. Let us let us know when it when it's ready. Uh, we'll we'll let our audience know, and and we'll love to have you back on okay. to talk about it and continue the journey. <laughs> Episode seventy two podcast for the fans by the fans. Peace. Yo, it's the freaking frack show, a podcast. For the fans, by this the is the freaking frack show, a podcast for the for fans, the fans by, by the fans. fans. Freaking frack show, a podcast for the fans, by the fans. All right, guys, you're watching the freaking frack show podcast for the fans.